So welcome once again. Tonight is the second presentation in the series on solving problems. Uh, basically, why hasn't technology caught up with where we ought to be by now? Uh, most people think of it as, where's all the flying cars? But there's a lot more things out there than that that are like, why are we doing that yet? Well, uh, before the holidays, I did a presentation on power and uh you know, we're out there trying to observe neutrinos, but nobody connects the dots and says, can we get power from them? Are there more neutrinos than there are photons? Is, is Since neutrinos are weakly interacting subatomic particles, they're wimps, are, are they really the source for uh, dark matter maybe? Don't know. But, uh, you know, it takes time to figure these things out, but somebody's got to start with, hey, what about, and that's what I do with these presentations is, hey, what about this? You've got all these problems with how we're doing it now. Maybe we should think a little differently. So tonight's is on propulsion. So as I mentioned, this is a series of them. Uh, we did power. Tonight is propulsion. Next week is on communication. And then the following week is on transportation itself. And I try and base all this stuff on research that uh, luminary folks the folks whose name you know and trust kind of thing, and Nobel Prize winners that have proven the underlying physics principles are not uh, smoke and mirrors. And sometimes it's uh, repurposing something. Um, you know, because something was designed for a specific purpose doesn't mean it can't be used for other things. And since nobody's connected the dots yet, uh, it is a matter of you're not going to go buy one of these on Amazon. You are going to have to uh, uh, do a little do-it-yourself or... Maybe there's some additional research required. But if you start with the premise that it's impossible or counters the known laws of physics, uh, I, I don't cook this stuff up on my own. There are uh, research luminaries that were here before me, and there are often Nobel Prize winners that have you know had peer-reviewed substantiation of the smoke and mirrors I'm discussing. So... But before it can be mainstream, it's got to have investment to uh, make it more optimal, make it uh, large scale production. So maybe some of the folks that are spending multiple billions of dollars on fusion power, high energy particle physics like CERN's uh, particle collider or quantum computing, for example. Uh, I know that a couple of companies have spent over a billion dollars each on quantum computing. Um, a small fraction of that would uh, bring some of this stuff to light. In tonight's episode, we'll talk about propulsion. So currently, uh, all of our rocket propulsion is based on chemistry. This is one of those, think about it for a moment. It's all based on chemistry. When we ignite fuels and the rocket goes up, that's chemistry. Um, if we have a compressed gas and we squirt out the compressed gas, that's chemistry because we're using a gas and we're compressing it to a liquid and then we're um, releasing it and allowing it to interact with the air pressure to make a little bit of propulsion. Um, if we look at ion propulsion, that's definitely chemistry. We're ionizing a gas that was originally compressed as a cryogenic liquid. Um, and there's only certain kinds of gases we can do that with. There are Nobel gases or noble gases. Um, and the newest stuff is melting materials, compressing them, and then squirting them out. Um, people took a look at inkjet printer um, nozzles and said, what if we make kind of a super inkjet printer and we take... Um, uh, iodine with other materials, and we make a hard brick of this material so we can pack more of it in a small space at small mass, and then we melt it on the fly, and then we accelerate it and squirt it out like an inkjet printer using piezoelectricity. Uh, that's still chemistry. So all the propulsion, all the forms of propulsion are all chemistry. And if you think of ion propulsion as being Electric propulsion, let me take away your fuel tank of noble gases and see if you still think it's electric. 
So the common problems they run into is propulsion duration is determined at the time of launch by whatever fixed containers of propellants they have, fuels, oxidizers, or material to be melted and squirted. If we want to uh, go faster or a little longer, we increase the quantity of these propellants, but that makes the rocket heavier, which actually reduces the maximum capacity. It gives it a harder punch, but the duration doesn't get any longer. And every time we do this with uh, materials, we have tanks of the materials, we have the plumbing to escort it around the launch vehicle, we have pumps, we may need additional tanks of stuff. Uh, I don't have many people are aware of this, but um, if you look at the upper stages of these rockets, if they're liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen as their propellants, um, if the liquid oxygen is the oxidizer, oxygen doesn't take kindly to zero gravity. If you don't have a full tank of oxygen under pressure, uh, you have to pressurize your oxygen tank to push the oxygen down to the pumps so the engine will work in the vacuum of uh, zero gravity. And they do this using a separate tank that's also fixed capacity containing pressurized liquid helium because the liquid helium has a tremendous expansion pressure and they use that to pressurize the liquid oxygen tank. Sometimes it requires multiple rocket types and multiple stages. Uh, if you've seen the Atlas V, they use several solid stage boosters on the sides and a liquid uh, multiple engine booster in the core. The uh, Falcon Heavy uses three liquid engines, no solids. And sometimes they use a common tank of fuel with multiple pumps and multiple exhaust nozzles and combustion chambers. So they're trying to save on tank weight by sharing the tank. But when you increase the number of engines, at some point, uh, you know, some of the engines are going to get more fuel faster than others. And whenever you uh, increase these numbers, you're going to need more control electronics for all the pumps and the valves and the heaters and all that stuff, plus the software development time and the time to test, do static tests. And all of these increase the mass of the launch vehicle. So I found it interesting that uh, you get about three minutes on whatever your launch vehicle is. So if you've got a high performance launch vehicle, like an Atlas V or a Falcon Heavy, you get about three minutes before the primary boost is done. You know, the solids drop away, the, the center liquid drops away. Total time is about three minutes. And you can look at a, a, a smaller rocket or a larger rocket, and it's still about three minutes, but they can lift more. But when you make the rocket bigger and you make the tanks bigger, the rocket weighs more. The tanks have more liquid in them, makes the tanks weigh more. So you're, you're, you're getting to a uh, law of diminishing returns. And ion propulsion, not, not, not sure how many people are aware of this, but uh, in ion propulsion, they rarely, if ever, run the ion propulsion engine at full throttle. Because at full throttle, it would exhaust the fixed gas tank in a few hours. So when you see like uh, um, these deep space probes that are ion powered that go for five, you know, five plus years, they're running the engine output at about 14% of total thrust for their multiple month propulsion, you know, going from asteroid to asteroid. Or in the case of the uh, Starlink satellites, uh, they're running at less than 100% propulsion, and they only turn on the ion thrusters, the krypton gas, not xenon, but krypton gas thrusters when they need to. But the satellites have a lifespan of at most about five years. If you look at compressed gases, when the uh, the Falcon booster is navigating its way back to either a drone ship landing or to land on land, um, you'll see these nitrogen bursts going off to keep the, the rocket vertical so it doesn't tip over and you know, cause problems. 
And those nitrogen bursts are very short lived. They're just, you know, second or so a piece when they burst just to keep the tip, uh, to keep it from tipping over. If they turn that on, uh, the nitrogen thruster would only last a couple of minutes. And then the uh, uh, propulsion solutions that melt something like an ion block and then expel it, those have a very limited thrust of about one Newton, and they're good for about five years. If they encounter a heavier than expected solar wind, that five years can be sheared off rather quickly. The common factor is they have a fixed at launch propellant supply that is typically uh, exhausted quickly. And even on the long duration flights, when it's exhausted, that's end of mission. So here's how they've been trying to improve things. Um, make each rocket motor capable of greater instantaneous output. Uh, try more exotic uh, fuels. They've tried this both liquid and uh, solid fuels. The problem is uh, there's people down on the ground. Uh, I know that when they had some solid chemistries that they've tried at the Cape, that it it damaged the paint on cars in the parking lot, you know, three miles away, because air is everywhere and this stuff disperses. So for liquid uh, propulsion, they build bigger, faster pumps, larger combustion chambers, larger exhaust nozzles, which all increases the weight. It also increases the uh, consumption rate of the fuels. When they get towards empty or near empty, they drop them off. Uh, in the case of some of the NASA Boeing programs, uh, they, they literally drop in the ocean and are not reusable. Uh, in the case of SpaceX, uh, they try and reuse them whenever possible. I uh, noticed that the booster they launched uh, earlier this month that uh, it had already flown 15 times. But um, even they're going like over the top edge, uh, the Falcon Heavy has 33 rocket motors on it. And when they ignited 11 of them on the test stand, it blew chunks of concrete out from beneath the launch. Uh, so they're trying to figure out what to do with that. They've improved the chemistry of the concrete to make it less susceptible to being blown up by the engine thrust. But their only thought is they need far greater cumulative thrust output. They're not really changing the duration much. It's still about three minutes. And ion, how do we improve ion? Well, um, bigger tanks last longer. Uh, if you're using a, a, um, a compressed gas, then maybe cryogenically cool it. Um, not much difference. You've got krypton and xenon. Um, you want something that's chemically inert so that it won't destroy your rocket, but you want something that you can charge up, you can ionize. So you're, you're, you're kind of left with krypton and xenon. Anything else that's up in the list, like fluorine would be like, oh no, no, don't do that, don't do that. Um, they could try running a higher output thruster at far less than maximum output to extend the duration. But ultimately when it runs out of juice, it runs out of juice. Even though the electronics are working and the solar panels are working, you got no fuel means, you can't course correct, um, much like Dawn at series is right now. It's just going to be there as long as it will be there, and eventually it'll crash into series. But it may be a lot of years. Most people aren't aware of this, but uh, another Achilles heel of ion propulsion is um, when you ionize the gas and you squirt it out the back, uh, the grid that you're ionizing it through doesn't take too kindly at being excessively overcharged. So what you do is you spew out non-ionized gas over the grid to decharge it. And that's basically wasted fuel. It's a little spritzer, um, but you can often see those when you look at an ion engine. You'll see the, the big gridding of where the main thrust comes out. And you see this little tiny, like looks like a sprayer nozzle. And that's to remove the electrical charge on the grid. So they're thinking about using uh, nuclear fission uh, as the electrical power source to accelerate the ions more so, but instead of turning it on for a long period of time, they're hoping that they can so accelerate the the gas that they could just, you know, pulse it periodically to give it a little bit of thrust. Um, so they're going to get um, maybe 
single digits of newtons. They're not going to get millions of newtons thrust, uh, which right now they're getting less than one newton. But if you spread that over a square meter, it's well less than one newton. But their mission duration is still fixed by the size of the uh, uh, Nobel gas, which is fixed at launch. So here's an example of them melting a brick of iodine doped chemistry. Uh, and when they melt it, they then accelerate the iodine. Um, and that becomes your thruster. Uh, these are relatively small, but they have very low thrust output. So they're using them for satellites for uh, keeping them on station. But once again, when you run out of your solid block of doped iodine, um, you're done. So all they've done is you know, found another way to have the satellites last about five years. And here's the diminishing return. Uh, the picture in the upper right is um, the SpaceX Super Heavy Booster firing seven of its 33 uh, first stage engines. And this was the first time they noticed this might be a problem. Uh, it wreaked havoc on the stands, the, the legs of the stand that actually holds the booster above the ground. Um, this one was not so much a concrete destruction. When they went to 11, it blew the concrete up. It didn't explode it, it just like blew away chunks of it that rained down over the area. Um, all of the sort of orange smoke you're seeing is uh, the oh. chemistry of the propulsive fluids mixing with the water uh, coming to keep the sound suppression down from it uh, audibly blowing itself yeah. apart. Uh, so it makes that orange giant cloud. And it, all the cloud gets to be water beyond that. So that's why it changes to white. It's just steam. You can only carry it so far before it just becomes theater of the absurd. So why are we doing it this way? You can go back to Newton's cannonball. Isaac Newton showed how if I fire a cannonball with a certain amount of force, it will go downrange and land on the Earth. If I fire with more force, it'll go downrange further, but still land on the Earth. Theoretically, I should be able to create a cannon and fire a cannonball that will have enough momentum that it will go around the Earth and come back and hit my cannon in the rear. So basically in orbit. And everything that we launch today is based on this same principle. We start with a certain amount of oomph, and that's all the oomph we ever give it. We never give it more oomph. So you have to give it a lot of oomph to get it to go around the Earth. And if you want to launch something heavier, you got to give it more oomph. So everything we do is Newton's cannonball. And if you want some examples of even deep space, when they run out of navigational or station keeping or orbital adjustment, liquid propellants, um, they're done. Uh, Cassini, they dove that into Saturn. Galileo, they dove that into Jupiter. Dawn is in a uh, low orbit around the asteroid series. They were all electronically still functioning just fine. Uh, they had solar panels. Uh, in the case of Galileo and Cassini, those were not solar. Those were actually radioisotope thermoelectric generators. So they had plenty of electricity. They just had no more course correction fuel. So they didn't want it to go off on its own to some place they didn't want it. So burned it up. In the case of Dawn, it's got solar panels. So it can still talk to us, but it's not going anywhere. It's not going to be doing anything different. By the way, not shabby for almost 400 years of science. Yeah. To today, we use 400 years old science to launch stuff out of the planet. It's amazing. Or you could look at it the other way and go, we're stuck in a rut. The longest lasting deep space vehicles that have currently no main propulsion at all are the Voyagers, Voyager 1, Voyager 2. They used large rockets to get off the Earth and out of Earth orbit. But once they were out of Earth orbit, they actually did slingshots or gravity assists around uh, large planets in the solar system to get them from planet to planet. They did not have the thrust with their maneuvering rockets to actually push them to the other planets. So they would go to like, you know, 
Mars and then Jupiter and then Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And after that, they were out of the solar system because they had no primary thrust anymore. This was well before ion propulsion existed. In fact, this was back when ion propulsion was considered a joke and not practical because it produced so little thrust. How could you ever use that? And then we had Deep Space One and then um, Dawn. Uh, and that pretty much said, yeah, you can use that. Even though it was putting out less than one Newton of thrust. So how is it that way out at the edge of the solar system, the Voyagers can still make sure they're lined up with Earth? It's because they use gyroscopes, momentum wheels, and uh, they're not actually changing their orbital, their orbit, their uh, trajectory so much as they are rotating on their current trajectory to face um, the radio uh, antennas on Earth. The reason why they still have any power is that far away from the sun, solar panels would be useless. They wouldn't produce enough electricity. So they're using radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTGs, which use uh, plutonium, not as a fission material, but as a thermal heat source of about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And the electrical power output from the RTG is about one-tenth of what it was when it launched because it's been 50 years. And you know, once you get down the notch of the half-life of uh, plutonium, you're going to get less heat out of it, which means less electrical power. But they use thermal couples. These are dissimilar metals that when you uh, infuse them with heat, they produce a small electrical current. And the thermocouples are actually the power source. The plutonium just produces the electricity by heating the thermocouples. But the downside is being that close to decaying plutonium, there's a lot of neutrons that come out of the plutonium and the neutrons uh, degrade the thermocouple metals. So the plutonium isn't producing as much heat, less electricity. The thermocouples are getting damaged uh, by neutrons from the plutonium, not producing enough electricity. So they've had to slowly turn off all the instruments on board the Voyagers. So they're not taking pictures. Uh, I think they've got a magnetometer and an electrical field density meter um, and the radios. And that's literally all the electronics that are left working. It's not because the electronics don't work. It's they don't have the electro electrical budget to run them. So if you want to have something run for a really long time, give it an RTG and send it out on its way and never expect it to change its trajectory because it's got no fuel left. If we're going to get past uh, Newton's Achilles heel, um, what we need is something that is inexhaustible. We don't want any kind of fixed tank of anything that would require resupply or ending the mission. Um, and if we don't have any tank on the vehicle, then that means we don't need any tank farm on the ground, no deliveries of cryogenic stuff, no pipelines. And because we have nothing in tanks to move around, there's no moving parts. There's no refurbishment should we get it back. Uh, there's no ongoing maintenance to moving stuff. And we also want something that is not reliant upon the sun angle. Or because if our probe goes behind a large planet like Jupiter, uh, how big a battery can we carry? How long is our probe going to stay in the darkness behind the planet before we can get some more sun on it? We don't want something that derives its propulsion by ground sourced gigawatt lasers because that level of energy diminishes as you get farther and farther away from the planet. We want something we can run at full output for a lot of years. We want it to work for all kinds of spacecraft, uh, deep space probes, satellites in orbit around the Earth, uh, spacecraft with people on board. We don't want something that's explosive. We don't want things that are going to blow up. Uh, we don't want it to be radioactive for either the people on board the craft or for the people on the ground. So we don't want something that uses uh, radioactivity or fissionable materials. We want something that can be 
mass produced cheaply in high volumes. And we want to be able to steer our spacecraft without having uh, momentum wheels or gyroscopes whose bearings eventually give out. This is why most of the spacecraft that have momentum wheels have redundancies because the bearings eventually don't work well after grinding on one another, even with the best lubricants in zero G. We'd like the ability to change direction, accelerate and decelerate rapidly. You know, we don't want to have to um, run the propulsion for six months just to get 10% faster like we do with ion propulsion. We like something that reduces the complexity and the cost over current solutions. We're tired of build, building the big bada boomba rockets uh, that consume a lot of billions of dollars. It'd be nice to have something that didn't try and punch its way through the atmosphere, uh, which means you have to build it structurally and aerodynamically sound to you know, go through sonic booms and max Q. So we want something that maybe starts off slower and then eventually gets faster. And when it comes back from space, we want something that we can slow down before it encounters the Earth's atmosphere. So we don't want to have to deal with the, the plasma effect of reentry, heat shields, parachutes, and we want to land anywhere we want to land. We don't want to have to have a dedicated landing area in case we blow up. We don't want to have to have well, we're going to land them in the ocean because it's softer and we can use parachutes. Uh, we don't even want a runway because, you know, runways are big and expensive. We want something we can land anywhere. And we want something scalable. We want something to work for a CubeSat or a major probe. So we want them for additional output, reliability, and redundancy. So uh, let's give up on the chemical and let's Let's start something different. Let's look for something that's fully electric. And I don't mean ion because ion still has a fixed tank. Not reliant upon chemistry. We're not burning or accelerating gases. And we're not using ground-based lasers. And we're definitely not going to be using something that's nuclear. So if you remember the previous presentation, you should be able to get an inexhaustible power source from neutrinos from the sun. And in that presentation, it looked like we could get about 50 amps, 20 kilovolts, uh, about a megawatt of power off of one of these neutrino power generation blocks. If we need more, we can string multiple of them together. It may be big and heavy, but it's a lot less weight on launch than would be, I don't know, a Falcon Heavy or an Atlas V or a... Uh, super heavy booster. So what we're going to be doing is generating a propulsion force using optimized radiation reflection pressure. We're going to generate a extremely high concentration of high energy photons, but not up into the X-ray or gamma level. Um, we're going to optimize the mirrors so that we get maximum transfer of momentum off of them. We're going to push the spacecraft front side to go forward. Nothing out the back, so we're not reliant upon Newton's third law. This is not a solar sail or a ground-based laser reflector. Those are not optimal. And it will be using Newton's second law, which is acceleration equals force divided by mass. So if we put more force into a fixed mass, we should get more acceleration. The additional force is from additional photons. So here's how radiation reflection pressure works. If you take light of a certain wavelength and you reflect it off of a surface, it transfers a certain amount of momentum to the surface it's reflecting off of. Some of the reflection comes off of that surface and can actually hit another surface and reflect off of that. So it's not just a single reflection, if you have a reflector that is shaped appropriately, you can get multiple transfers of momentum off of a single photon. And if you think this doesn't work, um, 
Kepler. Yeah, that Kepler, not the space program probe, the guy named Kepler back in the 1600s identified radiation reflect, reflection pressure as the reason why comet tails point away from the sun. Didn't know much about the solar wind back then. Um, in the 1800s, James Clark Maxwell, that guy, stated that light has momentum, but he had no efficient means of proving it. In the early 1900s, two researchers by the name of Nichols and Hull they actually did research and found out that you can optimize the amount of momentum transferred by adjusting the wavelength, the color of the light, the flux, how bright the light is, how many photons per square meter, the reflectivity, how polished is the meter, and then the angle of incidence. And they gave the information on how to maximize that. Um, they found that it works in both air and a vacuum. In fact, it works better in a vacuum because the resultant force is very small. So in the 1930s, uh, there were two other researchers by the name of Bell and Green that actually peer reviewed and redid all of the research of Nichols and Hull. And they did find some math errors that they could correct, but they found the principle to be correct. And they found that it works definitely in a vacuum. In the 1970s, for the Mariner space probe to get into orbit around Venus and around Mars, they actually had to factor in radiation reflection pressure from sunlight on the spacecraft. Otherwise, they couldn't have achieved orbit. So if you look into the early history of the Mariners and look and see what they did in the 70s to finally start, instead of doing flybys, to actually get into orbit, it was to calculate the radiation reflection pressure of sunlight on the solar panels and on the spacecraft. So in 2018, there was actually a Nobel Prize in physics for photon pressure tweezers, for optical tweezers. This was so they can move viruses and bacteria around the microscope, the uh, X-ray microscope slides. So it's a thing. It actually has a physical process. And if you're looking at solar sails and the proverbial EM drive, these are non-optimal approaches to it. They're still working with radiation reflection pressure, but they're not optimized. We'll get into what the optimizations are. So I know some people have seen the little thing that looks like a hollowed out light bulb, and it's got the little black and white veins in it, and they spin around when you shine light on them. That's actually called a Crookes radiometer the glass envelope is not evacuated. It's actually um, partial vacuum. And it's got an inert gas in there that expands nicely in the presence of heat. So that's what allows it to spin around is when you shine light on the black vein, the light reflects at, a, a hundred, at 90 degrees at an obtuse angle. Um, and therefore, you get the light reflecting back. But when it reflects back, it gets converted to infrared heat, which expands the gas behind it, and the expanding gas pushes on the veins. That's also why the front side of the veins are white, so that they won't have the same effect. So in the upper right, where the green check mark is, that's a Nichols radiometer. And they had a vacuum in there, and they had two small uh, mirrors. Uh, these, I think, were actually uh, silver or gold very small, thin foil mirrors, and they would shine light on them, and it would twist a thread, and they had a little indicator at the top that they could use to see how far the thread twisted. And from that, they could calculate the transfer of momentum from whatever light they were shining on it to the mirrors and see that they moved. And this is how they found out that if I change the color of the light from red up to blue through filters, I actually get more momentum transferred by higher energy, shorter wavelength light than infrared. And they also found out that by changing the angle of reflection, that uh, a direct angle, a direct perpendicular um, will actually produce almost no transfer of momentum, 
whereas uh, an acute angle um, will produce the most transfer of momentum. And uh, for the folks that think that this doesn't affect them in their daily life, here's some information. Inside of your car's tires, if your car supports the uh, tire pressure monitoring system sensor, the TPMS, it's that little idiot light on your dash that looks like the outline of a slice of a tire. When that little idiot light comes on, what's actually happening is the uh, heat of compression of your tire as you go along on the road um, will actually bend a small uh, nanoscale silicon disc and it will produce electricity. So as long as your tire is rotating and the crystal gets compressed by infrared, it will put out a certain amount of electricity and they have an analog to digital converter that will digitally measure that. And when the digital measurement falls below a certain level, that's an indication you don't have enough pressure in your tire and it turns on the idiot light. So whenever your car is driving around on its tires, it's producing electricity from radiation reflection pressure and keeping your idiot light off. So, you know, it's like the people say, I don't understand how this technology works. It can't possibly work. You got a mobile phone? Yeah. You got a GPS? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so this is another there you go kind of thing that uh, radiation reflection pressure in your everyday life is a MEMS chip inside of your tires. So how do we improve this? Well, we got to crank out more photons. So in the 1800s, the only source of photons they had was the sun. In the 1900s, their source of bright light was either carbon arc lamps or the sun. By the mid-1900s, when uh, Bell and Green were doing their reevaluation of Nichols and Hull's work, they could use flash lamps carrying xenon gas so they could get narrow um, wavelength and uh, very bright light. But today it's relatively cheap. There are these devices called chip onboard or COB surface mount technology LEDs. And they can put multiple LED chips under a little dome lens uh, on a single piece of uh, material, substrate, that uh, you know is a fraction of an inch by a fraction of an inch. And you give this thing 3.6 volts and it will produce one watt of almost purple colored light near ultraviolet. It produces 330 milliwatts per steradian. Now that just means that the light isn't uh, a narrow beam, the light actually spreads out. And you can buy these parts off the shelf, 10 bucks a piece, not exotically expensive in uh, available supply. Um, the measurement works such that the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, therefore you have higher energy photons, which transfer a greater momentum. And even Maxwell um, had a formula for this, the momentum equals Planck's constant divided by lambda, which is the frequency. So if we were to take this 365 nanometers and say, how much force do we get out of each photon? Not all the photons, but just one photon. It's a very, very, very small number. It's 5.442 times 10 to the minus 19th newtons. So that's way less than ion propulsion, but that's just one photon. Um, ion propulsion gets to the maybe under 20 millinewtons or thousandths of a newton for the entire output of the engine. So how many photons per second does this LED emit? Turns out it emits 1.84 times 10 to the plus 18th photons. Okay, that's a lot of photons. So if we go back to momentum per photon, and we now know the number of photons for one watt output, um, how much is that producing? It should produce just over one Newton. 
but we don't get to use all of that because it's spread over a wide area. But how much would that produce if we had one square meter worth of these LEDs? Well, I assume that to solder the LED down, it's going to consume about 25% larger space than the, the LED chip itself. So solder down these things so that you have, you know, an array of them so that you had a one meter square area. And how many would fit in one square meter? 67,227 of these. So if you wanted an emitter of force, there was only one square meter, one meter by one meter. It would produce 6.7 times 10 to the fourth Newton meters squared. That is more than any ion engine known to date, even the ones that are nuclear powered. So if you gang up multiple meters square of this, you get even more thrust. But you got to think about connecting the dots and working on this stuff and adding it up. I'm sure there are things that will make it less. And the first thing we have is package size. So how do I get the most photons output at the highest energy per square meter? Well, if I used an individual LED, like a little, little uh, LED bulb, that would be huge because I get very little output and it occupies lots of space. Well, what if I used a higher output, like a five water? Well, they have a lot of uh, metal tabs coming out to dissipate the waste heat. So don't use that one because even though it's got more photons coming out, it's over a larger square area. They have more, more waste. And don't even think about going to 10 watts. It produces a lot more photons, but it's a big fat. I mean, it's more than an inch by an inch. So you're, you're not going to come out right. So having these surface mount leadless chip carrier kinds of things works great. But there's another kind of technology called quantum dots. That's even better because instead of being something that's, you know, uh, 11 millimeters by 11 millimeters, the quantum dots are nanometers. The individual quantum dots are a billionth of a meter. But all they do is produce photons. So where you might have heard of quantum dots is in TVs, computer monitors, those really, really big TVs you see at the Consumer Electronics Show. Those are using quantum dots. And they will tell you all about the uh, particular kinds of inks they use in the dots. And they use different diameters of corrals at the nanoscale level to produce different colors using the same chemistry in the dots. So based upon the quantum aspects, let me get it right here, the quantum aspects, so if they want a particular wavelength to come out of the dot, they change the diameter of the dot, and it produces through con confinement the photons that are only of that wavelength. So you can have a, a red dot, a green dot, and a blue dot. And if you want a narrower wavelength, you make the dots smaller. So the smallest of the quantum dots is the blue. The biggest of the quantum dots are the red. But since human eyes are not as sensitive to blue as they are to green, um, you only need one green dot per pixel. You need one red dot per pixel, but you might need as many as three blue dots per pixel. What I'm looking at is, I want a lot of blue dots because blue is a shorter wavelength. And if I can change the chemistry slightly, I'd like some purple dots, please. And I use a uh, simple ultraviolet illuminator behind it, and they will produce purple light at very high photon densities. And you can switch these off and on using computer chips, something called pulse width modulation. You can adjust the brightness and turn, it off, turn them off and on. Um, if you wanted to do this with a TV panel, you'd get one that supports local dimming. So you could change the brightness in different parts of the panel. You might have also heard of organic light emitting diodes. These are physically larger, even, even the micro LEDs that they have now. They're still much larger than quantum scale dots. And it costs more to produce them uh, because you're literally making uh, semiconductors per dot. And they produce more waste heat. So go with the quantum dots.
How about reflectivity? Well, in the 1800s, the best mirrors they had were polished metal, which were pitted and uneven. By the time the 1900s came around, they had rear surface mirrors, you know, the typical glass mirror. But the light going through the glass actually reflects twice, once off the front of the glass, once off the silvered surface at the rear, so they would lose momentum. But it's the best they had. By the mid-1900s, they actually had polished front surface glass mirrors. These are mirrors where the reflective coating is on the front of the mirror, not behind it. But that was still not all that smooth. Today, we have aluminum oxide ion deposition on fused silica. So the glass is special to be ultra smooth. And then we uh, put it into a vacuum chamber and we ionize aluminum oxide, alumina, to uh, basically make a gas. And we electrostatically charge up the mirror plate. And then that draws the gas molecules onto the surface of the mirror. And we have a mirror that is 99 plus, not 100%, but 99 plus percent reflective. And if you ever want to buy a good diagonal mirror for your telescope, for your eyepiece, look for one that says it's a dielectric mirror. Dielectric is the process of ionizing the alumina and ion coating it on the glass surface. They are microscopically smooth. Nichols and Hull discovered that when you have greater reflectivity, you have greater momentum transfer. And now that we have ion deposition coated fused silica mirrors, we have even way more transfer of momentum than they could ever hope for. So if we go back to the original number and then we drop that down and say, we're only gonna get 99% off the surface of the mirror, we're still at 6.1 times 10 to the fourth Newton meters squared. And now we're going to improve the efficiency of the angle. If you remember the original uh, radiation reflection pressure, it showed a mirror, a single mirror, and the light would go in and bounce off of it. Well, what if you tilted the mirror like this, and instead of having just one flat piece of mirror, you had actually a cone-shaped mirror. And it was reflective on the inside of the cone at this very high level. So you do ion deposition on the inside of a cone that's been smoothed, and now you have a 99% reflective mirror, and the angle that you uh, have the photons reflecting is a very, very shallow angle. And the way you calculate the reduction is by factoring in the uh, cosine squared of the angle. So if you have a photon reflecting off of the inside of the cone at five degrees, it will transfer 0.992 of the momentum. When you get up to 45 degrees, it's only half. When you get to 90 degrees, it's zero because it would be a, a horizontal plate. All the light would go in and be absorbed and re-reflected as uh, infrared heat. And you don't want the propulsion going that way when you're trying to go that way. So you make a tip at the front of it to let all of those photons out. That's your photon exhaust. And then you need to make 67,227 of these things, the diameter of the individual LED. So they have to be very small, very reflective, and very smooth. But if you said, let's just count the first reflection, 45 degrees, we'll pick like a mid-level. We're only gonna get half. So we've dropped it down, and now we're at 3.054 times 10 to the fourth Newton meters squared. So if you have a square meter of these uh, emitters and you put reflectors on all of them and they're optimal reflectors, then three times 10 to the fourth. Now, times 10 to the fourth, think about that for a moment. Times 10 to the third is a thousand. Times 10 to the fourth is 10,000. So that would be 30,000 Newtons. Even if I'm off by Two factors. Let's say instead of 30,000, it's 30. 30 Newtons is still more than any ion thruster today. So remember that original reflection? What about the mirror itself? If the mirror is now a cone shape, the transfer of momentum is not going to be 100% in the direction you want it to be. 
because the cone is shaped like that, and the light's going to bounce off the inside, which means it's going to want to push the cone slightly to the side and not always to the front. So how do we correct for that? Oh, that's really simple. Uh, you dope the mirror. If you've ever looked into uh, the original ruby lasers, you found that a ruby by itself does not laze very well. But if you dope it, if you mix into the chemical brew a little bit of aluminum, different chemistry, it now creates something you can charge up and produce more photons. And we want to do the same thing with our mirror. We want to take the mirror chemistry, the, the ionized surface of the mirror, and we want to dope it so that it changes the index of uh, refract uh, reflection of the mirrored surface so it's slightly angled more towards the front of the cone. And by doing that, the transfer will be more in the direction you want it. But since I don't have the chemical processes to do that, let's say we're going to give up half of our uh, momentum. Now we're down to 1.527 times 10 to the fourth Newton meters squared. So in one square meter, we've got uh, 15,000 um, newtons. But that that's a little complicated. How, how do we make this thing cheaper and easier for like home do-it-yourselfers? Uh, there's this stuff called reflective polyester. They use it in food wrappers. It's very malleable. Uh, you could, you know, go, get your individual LED and coat the inside of it with this, make it 80% reflective, uh, very easy to do. So if you just wanted to try out one LED and see what you get, you could do that. Now you've got one LED and one cone. Uh, what if you wanted to gang it up? Uh, well, you know, these are cheap enough to make. You could make yourself something that was 10 by 10, uh, and it would produce um, 5.442 times 10 to the minus 17th Newtons, which is not enough to measure unless you're at the uh, NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio where you can measure nanonewtons. Because remember, a ninth is a nanonewton. So the only way this works is if you scale it up big time. But I, I haven't got the uh, engineering resources. So how do I uh, prototype this thing? How about with a TV? Go get yourself a uh, quantum LED 4K TV. You can buy a refurbished one for about 384 bucks on Amazon, about 450 new. And probably now that the CES is out, all last year's models are going to be priced through the floor crashing. But I don't really need all that. All I need is the panel. If you just wanted the panel by itself, you can apparently buy one of those on eBay for 37 bucks, and you'll get it on a slow boat from China. Um, but now you need something to act as your reflector. And there's a company that actually does those things. There's a company called Holographics. They will make you sheets of plastic material that is reflective. They can work features down to 10 nanometers. So more than capable enough for um, the, the QLED display panel. The only thing that would be odd for them would be creating the exhaust holes in the tips. But they do photolithography and ion beam milling as well. So just add to your service request. Could you make some like small holes in the tips? So now you have your quantum LED panel that's almost a half a meter by half a meter. And you have your reflectors. So make the TV show bright blue light and see what you get. Let's compare that with ion propulsion. Here is the NSTAR engine that was used on Deep Space One and on Dawn. They didn't believe that it was going to be reliable enough. So on Dawn, because it was going to be a longer mission, instead of having one ion thruster, they had three ion thrusters sharing a common uh, xenon fuel tank. The diameter of the ion thruster was 30 centimeters or about 12 inches, one foot, not a meter squared, one foot and it was one foot circular and if you look at the top of it you see this extra little squirt nozzle that's where it spews out unionized gas 
to discharge the ionization of the emitter grid. The maximum duration output given its fuel supply was 3,100 seconds, which sounds like a lot, but if you calculate it out, it's eight tenths of an hour, not even a full hour. So if they had opened up Dawn to 100% thrust, they couldn't even get an hour's worth of propulsion before they ran out of fuel. So they ran it at about 14% of its total output. And it consumed half a kilowatt, 500 watts of power to, to run at that level. And if you talk about weight, the Dawn spacecraft carried 425 kilograms or 937 pounds of compressed xenon gas. And that was enough for a mission duration of 11 years. But it wasn't just the gas, it was all the plumbing and the pumps and the heaters and uh, valves and electronics to control it all. It turns out that the ion drive assembly, the electronics, plus propellant was 987 pounds. That's before you added any instruments to the spacecraft or the solar panels or anything else. That was just the propulsion system. So if, if you could get a uh, QLED TV to produce um, even one Newton meter squared, uh, it would be producing it at a small fraction of the weight and a small fraction of the power consumption of the NSTAR engine. But you got to think to do it. But there's the naysayers out there who say, if I set a mirror in front of my TV, it doesn't push the mirror over. That's correct, because your mirror is flat. It's getting almost no transfer of momentum. Um, it's a, you know, maybe a small single digit number of Newtons per meter squared. But if it was that small, how would you even notice it? Well, if I cover my TV front with aluminum foil, it doesn't fly around the room. That's true. But that reflection is also obtuse and it's going to be generating heat, not transfer of momentum to move the TV. So if you saw that the aluminum foil moved away from the front of the TV set, is that because it heated the air between the aluminum foil and the TV and that expanded and caused the aluminum foil to move out? Because if, if you're not getting much transfer of momentum and it pushed on the aluminum foil and it wasn't due to infrared heating, how would you know? But but that's how solar sails in, uh, work in the vacuum of space, right? Yeah, but look at the solar sails that they're having for demonstrators. These are football field size mylar sails. And the spacecraft is a nanoscale satellite. So it's a little tiny cube set. You know, it's about as big as a Rube's, Rubik's cube. And then it's got a sail the size of a football field. And they shine a laser from the ground on it that's probably hundreds of kilowatts. Eventually, they want to make these bigger so they'll be gigawatts. There's a lot of nations on Earth that say, I don't want your gigawatt laser beam heating the atmosphere over my nation. So, no. So if you don't optimize it, you're not going to get the effect that you desire. But if you go to the effort to optimize it, you should get more than the force of an ion propulsion system. So what could I do um, with this thing? Well, I have a propulsion source that's many years, nil maintenance, high redundancy, replace it less often, no fuel tank, no fuel weight, no plumbing, no fixed capacity, pressurized helium to keep my gas from floating around, no heaters, no pumps, no valves. And I can put multiple on the outside surface of my spacecraft. I don't need reaction thrusters, no gyroscopes or momentum wheels. No pumps or valves or heating, uh, no RCS thrusters, no momentum wheels. I don't need the computer software for managing all that stuff. So the design time should be less, the test time should be less. And because I have continuous thrust, um, I can take off slowly from the ground while I'm in the Earth's atmosphere and only accelerate more 
once I get well above the Earth's atmosphere, so no max Q, no sonic booms. Spacecraft will be much smaller, way less at liftoff, because they don't have these massive engines and massive tanks, and you know I, I don't have the structural weight of all that stuff. So my spacecraft's going to be far less expensive, far less to manufacture. The launch complex itself will be less expensive and less complex. I don't have a lot of ground-based tanks and pumps and pipelines and don't need that stuff. I don't have a vehicle tank farm that could explode. I have no explosive chemicals. I have no lightning mitigation. Think about this, those big towers that mitigate the lightning. The reason why you have to mitigate the lightning is they're exhausting liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as relief pressure. If lightning hit that, it'd blow the whole rocket up. So that's why you have the lightning mitigation towers. There's no explosive force at launch. There's no force or acoustic suppression water needed to cool things down or to get rid of the shock wave. There's no toxic air pollution uh, at launch. There's no carbon on the outside of your spacecraft to clean up afterwards. Um, you don't need multiple stages to orbit. You start slow and just gradually accelerate up to the speed you need. You don't have to refurbish your boosters afterwards because they don't come back damaged from burning things. There's no upper stages to discard. You can bring them back. There's no heat shield. Spacecraft is fully reusable. There's no parachutes. Uh, there's no parachute inspection and repacking. Um, it's fully vertical takeoff and landing. You don't need to land out in the ocean. You can land on any uh, flat surface larger than the spacecraft. And when you're coming back, there's no exotic fuels that could blow up. So uh, just land in an open field. This one I thought was an interesting side effect. Artificial gravity. You know that it's not good for humans to be in uh, nil gravity for extended, extended period of times. It causes our cardiovascular system to weaken. Uh, it causes our bones to become hollowed and brittle. So that's why we have uh, treadmills on the International Space Station is so that the astronauts can work under an artificial stress to keep their bodies up. When we want to go on a deep space mission to Mars or further away, we want to have rotating sections so that we can use centrifugal force to create an artificial 1G. But that only works where the people are. You're not going to rotate the entire spacecraft because the uh, tanks won't be taking kindly to uh, you're rotating the propellant. And I now want to push the propellant out the back while it's being pushed to the side. That's not going to work. So you only want to rotate the section where the people are. That complicates your, your, your spacecraft. But what if you had an inexhaustible source of power and an inexhaustible source of propulsion. You can go faster whenever you need to. So what if as you were leaving the Earth, you produced an acceleration force of 9.8 meters per second squared? That would essentially be 1G. So you could take your entire spacecraft, accelerate it to 1G, and keep it at that acceleration almost all the way to your destination. When you got close to your destination, let's say it's Mars, you would turn the spacecraft around the other direction and accelerate it 1G in the other direction, which you would feel the downward acceleration pressing on you as 1G until you slowed up enough where you could do a slow re-entry without heating into Mars's thinner atmosphere. So now you have your artificial gravity. And it's less artificial than the uh, centrifugal force gravity because it's actually artificial gravity. It's, you know, we're accelerating you the same way the Earth's gravity does, so you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So aerodynamics becomes irrelevant. If you have a propulsion source that is inexhaustible and you start off moving slowly until you get above the atmosphere, um, you just change the angle of your momentum transfer and that adjusts your course. You don't have to go really, really fast at low altitudes, which means no supersonic, no max Q. The external skin and the internal structure of your vehicle 
no longer has to withstand those high pressure vertical compressions as you punch your way through the thicker lower atmosphere. You can make a much lighter structure. So if you took off at, let's say, 100 miles per hour at the lower altitudes, it would take you 60 minutes to get up to 62 miles of the Kármán line uh, or the edge of space instead of 3.6 minutes. Is that a problem? And you still have plenty of fuel left. So go slower, get up to altitude. It's about the same amount of time as you being in a commercial airplane and going from sitting in a gate until you get up to cruising altitude. That's about an hour. And as the air becomes thinner, you can accelerate more rapidly because you have no resistance or minimal resistance. And, you know, you're going to get up to low Earth orbit, 120 miles, in about 100 minutes instead of 8 minutes. So it takes a little longer. What's, what's the big deal? No aerodynamic shape, no structural compression. They're no longer design mandates. So when you're coming back, um, if you can slow down before you hit the Earth's atmosphere to maybe 100 miles an hour, then you don't need all of the aerodynamics, no wings, no heat shield, no parachutes, no plasma blackout, and you can land wherever you want to land. So the vehicle gets cheaper, faster to build. It can be shaped like even a blimp or a saucer. Okay, so if you had a spaceship that was shaped like a saucer and it had unlimited power and propulsion and it could change direction at a moment's notice and it would go all the way to space and move up slowly or fast at its choosing. Um, hmm, wonder what that is. So what would be the beha behaviors of this thing once you got it working? Well, it would lift off slowly. It would just go as fast as it needs to do. It would slowly gain velocity. Um, you wouldn't have multiple separation of stages. No gimbling required. This is also cool. Uh, rockets, as they want to get up to orbit, they actually tip over and they move to the east in order to catch the rotation of the Earth. As it's another thousand miles an hour that they can go just by going with the rotation of the Earth. So they can actually get up to orbit faster by going just straight up. So how would you get into orbit? Well, that's simple. Use gravity. Get up to the altitude you want, pitch over, and start coming back down, and you would actually get to an orbit higher than you need to be at, pitch over, and you would just let gravity start pulling you down, but you'd be at a distance from the Earth such that you'd go around the Earth. Orbit. And you could use continuous acceleration to generate your 1G for the whole of the vehicle. Behaviors would be like, there's no combustion, exhaust, glow, clouds, no roar of liftoff, no sonic booms on the way up or the way down, um, nothing visible at the rear of the spacecraft at all because there's no exhaust. The exhaust is actually out the front, and the front of the spacecraft would be kind of a glow. So it will be able to rapidly accelerate and change directions, and as it came towards you, it would glow. Sound familiar? Where's my X Files theme music? Do, 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 do. Yeah. So would that act? Would, would this actually be applicable? Let's say you could build a less expensive, inexhaustible, longer-lived, highly scalable propulsion source. Um, would that be any benefit of you? You know, larger uh, launch, smaller payloads, far cheaper. So it isn't the big launch vehicles that would be able to use this first. It's all those cubesats. Instead of spending millions of dollars to launch a CubeSat, maybe a few thousand dollars would be sufficient. Smaller companies could get into the spacecraft business and launch them, but you wouldn't need all of the fancy pads and the exotic fuels that could go boom, and you wouldn't have to have a helicopter catch your parachute, and you know, that makes it a lot easier and cheaper for the small guys. And there would be no burn-up of a working spacecraft when the fuel is exhausted. No second stages 
lingering in orbit and then falling back and burning up. You don't need to make something sturdy enough for max Q or sonic booms. Cheaper, faster to build, longer sustained, launch and land anywhere, nothing explosive, so anywhere could be a field. Um, you don't need to pick a particular latitude, launch from anywhere, anywhere. You don't need a runway to take off or land. If it were actually available, why wouldn't somebody invest money in it? So, well, I have a question. Are you developing yes. a new, um, it sounds like that there's going to be a new call for a lot of other jobs out there, such as yes. traffic controller. I yes. mean, if you have all of this going on and can land anywhere, there's going to be needing to be traffic controllers <laughs> in space. Yeah. There already are. There's the FAA. Yeah, but it, this is not something that they look at in this oh, it kind is. of it is. Anytime you want to launch something to orbit, you have to work with the FCC on your communications frequencies, and you have to work with the FAA on you going up, getting all the airplanes out of the way when you go up, and then when you come back down, getting all the airplanes out of the way when you want to come back down. But when you say that this is going to be on a massive scale compared to what they have today, yes. I mean, people can go anywhere. So they're going to have to expand that role. And it's yes. going to be different than it is right now because right now you can't go anywhere you want and you have to, and you're very big and very noticeable, you yes. know. Type thing. Yes. And now all of a sudden, so there, this is also looking for other jobs for the future. Oh yeah. Because once you can invite smaller companies to launch smaller things, uh, you may still have to go through the FCC for your radio and the FAA for your launch and landing vector and your orbit uh, coordinates. But there's going to be more of them. But the FAA is already scaling up to have many, many thousands of satellites in orbit. So I, I think it would be great for growing jobs, for growing industry. Um, it might make some of the bigger companies a little worried that if this thing gets scaled up large enough, it could mean you don't need the big bada boomba rocket anymore. Okay, so let's. Can I, well, would, would the person that's looking into going to Mars be concerned about this? I think they should be thinking about it, definitely. Yeah, but I mean, they shouldn't be worried about it, though. You were saying people at the higher level would be worried that they wouldn't need to have what they have now. Would, are those people who you're thinking of is the people that are planning to go to Mars? Maybe no, having no, a direction? No, no. It's any large corporation that manufactures and launches and recovers and refurbishes big, almost one-time use rockets. Think about it this way. Every time a rocket gets launched that has a second stage, that multi-million dollar second stage is a throwaway. It's going to linger in orbit for a while and then fall back and burn up. Imagine if you could create a product, sell it for a huge amount of money, and then it destroys itself every time it gets used. Oh, that's a lot of money to be made. Now, if you have somebody come in there and say, I can make it far less expensive, get you to the same orbit, and it doesn't burn up. That's going to put the big boys uh, in fear. And they're going to try and find ways to not do it. But let's, to make it. Let's, let's say that Nobody scales it up, and all you can get it up to is, let's say, a quarter of a meter in size, but it's very efficient. What would you like to do with it? Hey, Back to the Future hoverboard sounds good. That would be a proof of concept. And if the spacecraft was saucer-shaped, that would improve its aerodynamics. Cover the entire outside with computer-controlled photonic propulsion modules. You don't need... Wings, tails, propellers, jets, RC, RCS thrusters, or momentum wheels. And you can travel through um, the vacuum of space, atmosphere. Since there's no exhaust, hell, you can even tra uh, move underwater. Huh, that sounds familiar. Something that can travel without exhaust through uh, space, through air without aerodynamic wings and tails and even tra uh, travel through water. Gee, maybe you could do that. And if it does do vertical takeoff and landing, 
uh, anywhere, velocity becomes exotic. And what I mean by that is, if you think about the Dawn spacecraft, um, it turned on its ion propulsion for for more than six months to get it up to 47,000 miles per hour. Imagine if you had something that produced a thousand times the force of Dawn's ion propulsion and you could run it at full throttle for five years. How fast could it get going? Now, if you wanted to have an unmanned probe go to, I don't know, let's say uh, a planet circling Alpha Centauri, instead of 4,000 years, it might only take 40 years. That would still be doable. So, yeah. Propulsion could get exotic. But then as you clo you know, close on the speed of light, you have all kinds of other problems to deal with, like communications. We already know it takes a really long time to talk to the Voyager spacecraft, like 18 hours to send a signal up and then 18 hours to get a signal back. Once you get out beyond our solar system, um, you need a means of communication that takes less time. So our next discussion will be talking about let's ditch radio, which is electromagnetic radiation, and let's use something else to uh, modulate and use for radio communication. Maybe it's subatomic particles, um, quantum entanglement, or gravity waves. But that's what we're going to talk about next time. But this time, when you're talking about connecting the dots yep. and saying that uh, this this is what you foresee, that th these things are going to come about, because we do have the information to be able to do some of this. Some of it, that, you, like you say, you're going to run into other problems that you don't know what they're going to be because of or you may know that they're going to be, but you don't know what the solutions are because you, you build one to another dot to another dot. Sometimes yes. get yes. more complication. But you're saying that this is realistic and that this has come about because of our recent discoveries or that we've known about no. this for a while? No, we've known about this for a while. It's only in the last 50 years that we've improved the mirrors and we have LEDs. And we can apply these things to nanoscale technology like quantum LEDs, uh, quantum emitters, that um, we can connect the dots together. So none of this is all that new as of today. The physics principles date back to the 1800s. The uh, technology improvements are within the last 50 years. And putting it all together is something that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. We, fig we figured out ion propulsion, but it took 40 years to get the smile off of physics assholes. You know, yeah. when ion propulsion was per first proposed, they said, it produces less than a Newton. What the hell are you going to do with that? So they set it aside. And it was only a small budget number of researchers that said, I think we can do something with this. Why don't we try it out? And there was a NASA program called Deep Space One. They wanted to try out five new, you know, bleeding edge technologies. It was a not really a science mission, it was the technologies mission. And ion propulsion was one of its forms of propulsion. They also had hydrazine thrusters on it, but they wanted to see whether ion would really work. Is it practical in deep space? And they found out, damn straight it is. <clears throat> so that was how they did it. You start with a small budget, with a small number of enthusiastic people who can mentally connect the dots, and then you start working through all the necessary optimizations um, the squirting out uncharged gas to neutralize the accelerator grid, that came late in ion propulsion. You know, of the 40 years that took them before Deep Space One, that was probably 10 years before Deep Space One that they realized that the grid, if it gets overcharged, would produce diminished thrust. And by squirting some unionized gas on it, it would discharge it. 
and allow the grid to last five years. That that was a revelation. But uh, until you start working it, uh, what is it, the phrase, um, prototypes are easy, production is hard? So so now we know about these uh, neutrinos. Now yeah. they're becoming very popular to know. I mean, yeah. it's been known about for, I don't know, 20 years, neutrinos? No, no, we've known about neutrinos for almost 50 years. Okay. Uh, as a uh, theoretical... And they, they weren't article. experimented when we did the other then? I mean, you're saying that 50 years ago they did the, this uh, deep space one. Did they use neutrinos then no. too? No, no. They used radioactive plutonium. Radioactive so why did they use like neutrinos? Do they not know how to work with them, maybe? For the same reason that ion propulsion was not used the same day they thought of it. What are you going to do with that? It produces such a small amount. That's, that's, that's not even worth mentioning. No so need. neutrinos were not as popular to use because they were even less of a quantity. Yes. Neutrinos are considered WIMPs, W-I-M-P-S, weakly interacting particles. But but they're not considered, I mean, it's becoming very popular in the news today. I mean, oh, that, that's, a because, that's, about because, that's because a couple of years ago, there was actually a Nobel Prize for neutrinos changing flavors. That was going from electron neutrinos to muon neutrinos to tau neutrinos there are different energy levels of neutrinos and how could that occur if neutrinos were no mass they have no charge but until that nobel prize they said neutrinos have no mass like photons have no mass but photons may not have a mass but they have momentum and depending upon energy they can transfer their momentum through reflection. Well, neutrinos can do the same thing. They have mass, which is momentum. And if you can absorb a neutrino and produce electrons from it without wasting the electrons as light, if you can conduct away the electrons as voltage, you now have an unlimited power source. So, so this is new. This is the, the, the reason we can utilize it more. Yes. And we could have because before. because they have mass and because they have mass and they will interact with only certain materials weakly you don't want it to push the material you don't want to transfer the momentum as a force you want to transfer the momentum as a net electrical charge basically produce electrons and if you produce the electrons and you can conduct them away using existing semiconductor technology, you now have an unlimited source of power. So there are people working on this now. Yes. You're, yes. There's, an, there's, an entire, there's an entire website of multiple corporations working on, if you just Google the two words, neutrino power, you will find there's a lot of companies working on it. They're all trying to get the right formula to make the right numbers, because right now it's really small. But all they're looking at is, uh, how do you contain the light? Like, don't let it become light. Transfer it away as an electrical charge. So they'll, they'll get it eventually. Just like ion propulsion is now like so important and so popular and so meaningful that every SpaceX Starlink satellite has multiple krypton gas ion propulsion units on it well eventually you know eventually there'll be photonic propulsion and they won't need a gas tank and valves and plumbing and heaters and all that stuff spacecraft will get lighter and they'll last longer and yeah as i say first you got to see the dots then you got to have the faith to connect the dots then you got to go find somebody with money to help you pay for the optimizations so if we have ion propulsion, um, we can now have lighter, cheaper rockets, um, but we need somebody to invest, but the investment does not need to be as massive because you don't have a huge rocket, you don't have a huge facility to manufacture it, you're not throwing things away, you don't need to recover and refurbish them, you don't need to build a huge launch complex out of poured concrete, you don't have tank farms and pipelines and fuel deliveries, 
much lower cost, much smaller farms can do it, firms can do it. And by having this ability, we might be back to the moon or Mars or to the stars sooner. And if we have this ability, maybe we can have colonies by you send up a lot of smaller spacecraft that are parts convoys. And those go land somewhere like the moon. And then you have the big bada boomba rocket land the people. And now you have people that can build with the materials that are already there. See the dots, connect the dots, have the faith there to invest in it, and then you can do it. So I've got the usual links for Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell and Radiation Reflection Pressure, Nichols and Hull's work, Bell and Green's work, um, the NASA Instar Ion Propulsion Drive, that uh, LED that produces the uh, power output, uh, if anybody's interested in Samsung TV, um, and then the company that makes the uh, quantum scale mirror surface for the LED TV, for the uh, QLED TV. And once again, thanks for watching. Comments? Questions? It's not possible. Physics doesn't allow it. It violates the conservation of momentum. Takes well, too long. Takes too long. Takes too long, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I want my rocket to be in orbit in 18 minutes, not one hour. No, I actually have a, a spreadsheet that I did all the calculations through, and I worked it up from the um, momentum formula through the reflection, optimizing it per LED, what would I get? How much space each LED would take up? The solder, you know, soldering them down, the waste area around them with the uh, soldering the feet on the bottom and all that stuff and kept reducing it and reducing it and reducing it. But I would be happy if uh, the Glenn Research Center in Ohio took just one LED and one conical reflector and set up a rig in their uh, uh, nano Newton gravity reading meter and just ran that. I'd like to see, is the net a number greater than zero? And is it peer reviewable greater than zero? Well, obviously it's cheap enough to build it. The most expensive part will be getting the torsion balance or the, uh, the vacuum pressure meter um, for calculating the net Newtons of just one LED. Or you could have the faith and build something that's a meter by meter um, and now you've got a sizable number of Newtons. You, you could measure it by watching it, you know, swing on a chain. <laughs> and I didn't even mention the other proof about uh, light having momentum that's transferable, which is the LIGO gravity wave detector. They have these 40 centimeter parabolic reflectors that they use for the interferometer for the gravity wave detector. And when they bumped it up from a 20 watt laser to a 60 watt laser and they turned it on, the mirror moved a fraction of an inch. The density of photons hitting the curved mirror caused the mirror to move microscopically. And they didn't know what was causing it. What is this? What is this? And they got had to go talk to somebody and they say, have you ne never heard of uh, you know, radiation reflection pressure. And they said, no, no, tell us about it. And their solution to the problem was when you turn on the mirror, turn it on at full power, and then wait for the mirror to stop swinging. That's literally how they solved the problem. They didn't go, hey, could that actually be used as a source of propulsion? Nobody connected the dots. Two dots sitting right there in front of you. Laser. High flux photons, mirror. Yeah, well, they thought of it as a problem. Yeah. They saw it as a problem to be eliminated, not as a, yeah. huh, that moved a rather heavy mirror. <laughs> but, you know, you got to get it before you got it. You were talking about using centrifugal force for gravity? Yes. Okay, I wrote something where they said if they did that, you wouldn't sustain the gravity. If you no. kept turning, eventually you would no longer have that force. Yes, yes. There's actually a video on YouTube about 
Um, first of all, the physiologic effects are not completely mitigated by centripetal force or centrifugal force. Um, and because you're moving it not as um, a linear force, you're moving it as a rotational force, things would eventually catch up which is not something they had thought about. They just thought it was a good solution to the problem. What if you continuously do that for like, I don't know, eight months? Well, the actual net gravitational force or simulation of it would decline over time. But if you're accelerating under 1G, it would continue. There's a little guy whose uh, last name begins with an E. I think it's Einstein who said, you couldn't distinguish moving in a spacecraft at 1G from being on the Earth at 1G. And that's true because it's the force of acceleration that holds us to the planet. There was a book I found in high school about artificial space stations where people were living in it. It was like a giant barrel, and that was their story. It was as it was turning, that gave you the gravity. Oh, remember, could... remember Babylon 5, the core of the station rotated. I never saw it. Oh, Oh, you got to see that. Add that to your bucket list of uh, sci-fi with a uh, message. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it's... It, was a, it was a beautiful, really, but there's in the 70s, I think, beautiful pictures of paintings of these big oh, yeah. huge world of trees and all this stuff, and that was their thing. And if you jumped high enough, they have to take a big pole and pull you back. Yep. You know, we think of things, but we don't think of them thoroughly. And then eventually we go, well, yeah, that's not going to work. But then sometimes we think of things in science fiction, and it turns out if you spend enough time on them, they actually do work. Or have you not seen a Falcon 9 landing on land? It goes up, separates from the second stage, flips around, does a short burn to kick back some of the energy, does another longer burn just as it's coming down. It has titanium grid fins that steer it. It has nitrogen thrusters to keep it vertical. Legs come down. The, the legs are kind of weird. There's no actual motors that cause the legs to come down. The legs get pushed out from the side, and it's the fact that it wants to come down to the ground that is the force that pops the legs down. And the, the legs come down. It's maybe 30 feet above the ground when the legs pop out and lock. But it's the fact that it wants to go down, and when they pop out from the side, they want to go down as the rocket turns on its one engine and is slowing down, the legs snap down and it lands. So here you have something that was from science fiction of you know a rocket landing back on Earth, single stage to orbit kind of thing. And now because of SpaceX and a lot of thousands of engineers who solved problems as they saw them, you now have it landing, but they still have a fuel limitation. So if they go up too high or too far away from the launch pad, um, they have to land it on a drone ship out in the Atlantic Ocean. But if it's going at just the right angle or predominantly south, then it's not going up too high or out too far. Uh, there's enough fuel left in the first stage or in the side boosters um, to bring it back to land. And they're going to be doing one of those uh, January 12th, I think it is, launching a Falcon Heavy. And the two side boosters are going to come back and land at the Cape, not even out on a drone ship at sea. And the core booster, they're going to exhaust all of its fuel, and it's going to fall back into the Atlantic Ocean and not be recoverable. So I'll stop sharing at this point, and I'll stop recording.